session for Common Desk, which is which is good. Um, so this really came up when I recently published a um, infographic that was about uh, communication during crisis. And as soon as I sent that out, I heard a lot back from clients, uh, past clients, uh, current clients. And it seemed to be a really hot topic because we are, with the COVID-19 situation, really in a, um, a spot where um, a, a miscue in communication or a misread in communication can really have some lasting impacts on uh, both our individual and, if, you, if you're with a company, our, our corporate, um, your image almost. So. Um, I'm going to pull up this, uh, this slideshow here and uh, take you through a little things that some things that I've seen rapidly emerging over the last four weeks with, um, with communication and leadership during this crisis. Now, I've, I was specific to choose this common desk picture because if, if you are coming to Granite Park and you want to look for me, just walk past those booths, go towards the window, and there's a good chance I'm sitting alongside the window. And sometimes we get uh, me and a few other members and we call it our, our, our old guys coalition along the window with four or five of us back there. So that's where you can find me. Um, so this is, this is the inf infographic that I pushed out. And uh, it was really aimed at people who were familiar with DISC to, um, to understand that when you are in a state of crisis, when you are in a state of stress, um, not just a, a, a global pandemic, um, although that certainly is creating a lot of stress for all of us. But any time that you're under a high degree of stress, what can happen is the way we think we're communicating, the way we think we are behaving um, is not necessarily what's perceived. And that's because we are in a stress situation in which we're probably not guaranteed, but probably more likely to react to something uh, that's put in front of us, put before us, or asked to make a decision, or during a phone call, or even publicly, uh, because we're, we're kind of under that stress, we may go to our knee-jerk reaction more so than thinking and responding out, why am I communicating in this way? Why am I saying this? And this is important because this impacts your leadership credibility. Now, when I say leadership, I, um, I work with clients to uh, engage entire teams and companies in the idea of servant leadership, which one of the foundational beliefs is of servant leadership is that everybody in the organization is a leader. You don't have to have a title to be a leader. And so each of your, as say for Common Desk, each of you are leading through this, through this pandemic as representatives of Common Desk. And frankly, as a Common Desk member, I'm seeing a lot more of your leadership than I am from Nick. And that's the way it should be because you are the front line who are serving us as members. But the thing is, when you're in a crisis, you can really end up having this spotlight on you. And I chose this image on purpose because uh, when you're in a crisis, your, your leadership and your communication has this bright light spotlight on it. And that's awesome when you're doing very cool things. So when you decide, like Common Desk did, that um, you know, Common Desk values is about uh, creating community, and the mission is to create authentic communities, then you, spot it, then you just shine a brighter spotlight on that and say, look, we can still do this mission just virtually while we get through this. The other, the other side is that when you make mistakes, when you, when you uh, act out in ways and communicate in ways that you're not so proud of, there's a bright spotlight on that right now. And um, from a leadership perspective, or even from a, a, a small to large company perspective, this is a photo shoot you're looking at here, and people are taking snapshots for future decisions on how you behave. And so it's very likely that if you're in some sort of communication situation, gosh, many, many of us are quarantined at home, and um, it's easy to react in a way that does possibly permanent or at least long-term damage to, to relationships in the workplace, at home, you name it, that snapshot could be remembered for a long time. So I think now's a really good time to focus on how effectively we're communicating, but even more so how we know ourselves of how we communicate. So I think one of the best tools to use that is the DISC model. I, don't, I know, um, I think some folks on here might have done a DISC when you got hired. You may know your profile, you may not. 
Um, I like this because it's very simple. It's easy to remember. And it's not a, um, it's not a quote unquote personality test. It's not measuring intelligence or skills or your values. Everything in DISC, you can literally observe the behavior. And I've done it with hundreds of folks. And uh, I've never had one come back with their DISC assessment and say, well, that was not me. What the heck happened? Um, I have had many come back and say, oh my, I had one even say, I swear, Matt, you're in, I'm in New Orleans, you're in Dallas. I think you drove down, drew some blood out of me while I was sleeping and had it analyzed. This thing is so accurate because, and she's saying that because these are behaviors that we can observe in ourselves. Um, and so it's important when we think about typing, putting ourselves in certain, uh, certain types or classes that there's no profile or result that's better. Um, there's no uh, certain position that should be a certain sort of profile. Um, it does not mean you communicate better because you're a D, an I, an S, or a C. What it's really about and how it relates to leadership is that it's about knowing yourself. It's about knowing how you tend to behave. It's about knowing that in certain situations, you're more likely to react in one way than the other. And then taking that awareness and understanding that as you observe others react, they have their own journey. They have their own communication patterns. And it may not be, you may not want to just climb up a ladder of assumptions and be in the completely wrong spot of thinking, um, you know, they believe this when it's really just a behavior miscue or a, um, uh, a behavior uh, communication way that we tend to behave that's different than the other person. So if you have not, um, we're going to do a little bit of a, um, a cheap, down and dirty, cheap, i.e. free disk assessment here. This is not typically how I do it with clients. I have a, a full online assessment um, company that I work with, and you take some, you go online and you take the assessment and you get this long 40 some page report back. But uh, there's some of you who may not have a disk profile and understand it. So just take, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a minute here. And what I want you to do is I've put on the screen here four columns of words. And these are grouped uh, based upon certain profile patterns. And what I'd like you to do is just take a look at those and pick out the top 10 that just jump out at you immediately of saying, that's, that's how I want to communicate or that's how I see myself. Pick out the top 10, and then I want you to look and see if there's a cluster of four, five, six, seven, maybe nine, all in one column. That's what I'm most interested in. So just take a second to do that. So I'll leave this up here for a little bit more, but um, I hope that as you went through, maybe one of those columns seemed, seemed to be more predominant than the other. And um, if it did, then you probably are pretty familiar with your profile. So I'll drop those on there. And those are the four disk profiles that align with each of those keywords. Now, again, this is not a full assessment. This is really just a quick guess. I'd say put maybe a 30, 40, at most 50% accuracy rate on this because it's a much more detailed process, but it gives us a little bit to work with. Um, and so if you, um, if some of you know me uh, from just being around quite a bit, you may make some educated guesses about me as well. Um, and so um, that also then leads into people starting to make educated guesses around, well, where's my boss on this? Where's my spouse or significant other? Where's my, um, in our house, we even sometimes use this around the dinner table. That's pretty nerdy, I know, but the kids, kids actually like it. Um, so as you look at this, that not only identifies where you may be in these four profiles, but also helps you understand 
where others and how others are showing up. So you might have guessed it. Yes, I am a dominant I, um, which makes it um, very comfortable for me to jump on a webinar with a few days notice and do something like this. Um, and I use that as an example because that doesn't mean that an S or a C couldn't do this. It's that they would ha not maybe not be as comfortable and work a little harder at preparing to do it. So one, again, one profile is not better than the other. So let's take a quick look at these. So if you divide them up into four quadrants, the D stands for dominance. Um, the I stands for influence, S is steadiness, and C is conscientious. So our dominant folks, um, if you're really thinking about what do the Ds prefer to deal with, it's problems and challenges. They're the first ones to raise their hand saying, we need this solved, we need this done, we need to accomplish this. They're very competitive. In, in getting it done. And so that's not to say the other three profiles cannot accomplish, uh, tackle problems or take on challenges. It's just, it's not their first preference. See, the eyes are all about people and contacts. So if you were to ask me, hey, we got this challenge, uh, can you tackle it? The first thing I might say is, hey, I know so-and-so who's done this before, let me reach out to them. See how I went immediately to the people and contacts. S's are steadies. They're more focused about a slow and steady pace and being consistent in relationships. So the first question there might be, we have this major problem. How is it going to impact my relationship with my boss, my relationship at home? That's going to be the first question. And conscientious are all about procedures and constraints. Um, they tend to love uh, to-do lists. They tend to love spreadsheets and systems to make sure we stay within certain timelines and structure and procedures. So if you look at the next one is not moving beyond their preferences, but more about their task focus. So when you give the Ds a task focus, it is all about let's get it done. Sometimes not even done correctly, more about let's get it done. Eyes are about let's get let's do it together. Who is going to be on my team? Who will I be working with? Who can help us the most with this? Uh, and sometimes while they're doing it together, the eyes can kind of forget about the details and spend the first, if you're going to have an hour planning meeting, the first 30 minutes, if it's all eyes, might be all about their weekend um, because, the, the, again, they don't have that necessarily that let's get it done drive. Steadies are all about how will we feel while doing it. Is there a risk of alienating, alienating someone? Will someone be left behind? Will, um, it, are we making sure that everybody's included? Conscientious. Primary thing is let's do it right. It has to be done correctly. Sometimes even to the point of it has to be done so correctly that we miss deadlines because it has to be 100% done. Uh, the core beliefs uh, of the D is I'm valuable if I'm on top. Again, it's a very competitive mindset. The I's are about if I can attract people, what do people think? Uh, steadies are about if I'm accepted and, pl and please others and conscientious is the first question is I'm valuable if I'm competent. Am I doing it right? Now, again, this doesn't mean that the D doesn't try to please or that the C doesn't worry about attracting people. This is just their primary knee jerk reaction to doing it. So quick, uh, 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 Ultra, this is a four hour class that I'm gonna condense into just a few minutes here. So we're, we'll go through these kind of quickly, but if you are a D, um, some of the strengths that you have is that you can take charge, get things done, not willing, not, not gonna hesitate on taking a decisive risk just in the name of getting it done, getting it accomplished. Pretty fearless, no obstacles too big to overcome and they are very attentive to making sure the bottom line is met. So in doing this, what can be harder for them is that repetitiveness. They don't like doing the same, tend to not like the same tasks over and over and over again, because they want to come up with something new. They want a new challenge. They can definitely have problems being diplomatic and can come off very strong in conversations. Um, there can be lots of, um, resistance to rules and regulations, not so worried about uh, rules and regulations as making sure that it actually gets done. And uh, they tend to be not so open about personal matters. It's not that they don't like people or sharing personal matters, it's just that uh, doesn't really contribute to the bottom line in their mind. 
So a, uh, a famous D that you might be familiar with, Judge Judy, uh, is definitely a D profile. Um, I always um, try to integrate my kids' ideas into my presentations. So I got my son involved, and I said, who is the dominant D in Star Wars? That's a no-brainer with Darth Vader. And then my daughter has had a recent renaissance with The Office, um, watching that during quarantine on Netflix. And so the D there is um, very clearly our friend Dwight Schrute is um, very direct, doesn't have any hesitation in giving direction to others. So the, uh, moving on to the eyes, what do they do best? Eyes are inspirational. They inspire others to take action. They're, very, they're able to think on their feet more so than the other profiles. They can be creative. They're full of ideas and can be impulsive in trying them. Now, the downside to that is that impulsiveness is you can throw out an idea and there's a good chance you're going to get an eye to jump on board and do it uh, or, or be excited about it. The problem is the follow through. So I've, I've shared with you all, I'm a, I'm a high eye. Uh, for about the last uh, five or six years, I've been co-writing about six books with other eyes and we don't, none of them have ever gotten started. That's because we get on these calls, we get excited. Hey, we're going to write a book about that and then we don't follow through. So it's easy to be uh, to, to, for an eye to get motivated and do something. The follow through is the tough part. They're great people to promote ideas or opportunities to people because they are about influence. What can be hard for them, restrictions or routines, uh, formal reports or keeping detailed records. Sometimes routines can get them easily bored and they don't like to redo things over and over again. So I love, you're not going to scare me as an eye to come and say, hey, let's create this. Let's put it on a tight timeline and get it out there. Uh, and I've done that with several clients and the first couple classes are great. And then they ask me to do it 10 more times for 10 more groups. And it takes a lot of work for me to stay focused and get as, as excited as I was the first time. I have to be intentional about realizing that's not really what I love doing. So for sure, Oprah is a very well-known eye from the Star Wars world. It's got to be Han Solo. And uh, yes, indeed, the eye of the office stands out very dominantly uh, with our friend Michael Scott there. S's. Um, S's are great at bringing harmony to group situations. Um, they tend to be friendly and sensitive, great listeners. They build networks of friends to help do work. They coordinate and cooperate with others. Even if there's conflict, the S is going to be the person that's great to have on a team to bring some calm, bring some cooperation, take uh, emotions that are up here and bringing them more down to a steady level. So on the flip side though, they're not, they don't really love competition because if you're cooperating or coordinating, it might uh, mean everybody wins and competition means sometimes people have to lose. So it's harder for them to be competitive. They, uh, in that same vein, they don't love working with uh, dictatorial or unfriendly people. They're more, they're, they are more concerned about the emotional impact of decisions and things that happen. They tend to be slower on making decisions. Don't, they do not dislike, they, they don't like change. And it can be hard for them to voice a contrary opinion or sharing emotions. So this is um, one of probably one of the best contrasts in my household. I am a, a, a very high I and my wife is a very high S. And so her pace of conversation is much slower. It's very difficult for her to come out and state an opinion because um, it's more about the harmony that's going on in the group than actually getting it done. Bill, uh, Jimmy Carter, who was a president before all of y'all were born, I think, everybody that's on here, is a very well-known S. From Star Wars, I think you have to go with the uh, very reflective Luke Skywalker. And then one of my favorite characters from The Office is Phyllis. Because you notice as Phyllis is planning a party, she always smooths over the group. Even though people shoot her down, she still keeps it smooth, keeps it going, keeps it level. Um, so definitely Phyllis is the, uh, is the S. Lastly, the C's. Um, the C's, remember, are all about being organized. So you see might even plan spontaneity. I, I, I have a client who's a very high C. Uh, he's a director of about 500 stores nationwide. I asked him 
I said, hey, I heard you're going on a cruise. And he says, yeah, I'm pretty stressed out about it. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, we leave in 60 days and I haven't packed. And we haven't planned every, every port. And I was like, man, I usually pack like the night before. And, and he said, no, I'm usually by this point, I got everything planned out. I got every day, every moment. So he's, he's literally planning the fun. They plan thoroughly before deciding to act. They're quick to uh, think, but slow to speak. So sometimes C's are just grossly misunderstood in meetings because it seems like they're not paying attention or not taking part. What they're doing is they're processing. They're thinking all the way down the road of how to actually implement it. And they, they plan to meet those. So I have a, a colleague that I work with, Dwayne Trammell. He's a high C. And we'll, we'll get together and I will throw out an idea. And before we went through DISC as, a part, as, as business partners, I used to always think he was shooting me down. Because he would ask questions of like, well, I don't understand how he would do that piece. I don't understand how he would do that piece. I don't understand. I'm thinking, well, fine, give up. I'll, never mind, dude. Well, it's not that he's shooting it down. Is that he is already in phase four of implementation and thinking those through and wants some resolution around that. So it's hard for C's to work in a, a, with unpredictable people, disorganized environment. Um, they're really more focused about the work and not personal matters. Um, they tend to work alone and they don't do great with incomplete or unclear directions. They want to know where they stand and what it'll take to uh, succeed. Bill Gates is a, a clearly a C. <clears throat> if you're saying C, you got to go with C-3PO. And then, uh, and I bet you guys have already guessed who the C is from the office. Of course, Becky. All right. So let's go back to this, uh, to this infographic because now, you have a little bit of an idea. Okay, here's a profile. Here's how the profile tends to communicate. Here's how um, I am different than other profiles and some ways larger than others. Um, and so we're back to this time of stress. So those differences, those reactions are going to be very, very dramatic. And it is so important because here's the downfall. We tend to judge ourselves based on our intentions. Here's what I meant to say. But during stress, when we're in that reaction mode, it can be a really good chance that others are judging us on the actual behavior that's out there. And there's, um, to date, in my coaching practice, I start with a deep dive into DISC, and I always have my clients highlight three or four things that they disagreed with in the report. And then they say, yeah, that wasn't me. And then I always ask them to go find someone in their life, especially if it's someone you live with, or a boss or a coworker, Someone go in and show them those three things and say, I disagree that I do this. What do you think? And I bet you um, every time they come back and they say, yep, they say I do that. I just didn't realize it. I showed my wife my disc um, at one time and I said, it's this little thing here that says can overreact by minor negative news. I'm like, I don't do that. I'm pretty calm and steady. And she just started laughing. And she said, the number of times I've seen you storming through the kitchen saying, oh, this client wants this one slide change. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to fire the client. And then an hour later, I'm over it. She says, trust me, you, you definitely do that. So let's, uh, so as we're uh, doing some of these stress driven behaviors, it may take a, it, it's worth taking a look in the details of why that's happening. Because most of our behaviors come from some sort of need. So you see here, the needs of the D are to be in control to make sure that there's evidence that we're making progress, make a really quick pace towards those, towards a progress and make accomplishments. Now, if you're in an environment like COVID-19 where every day the data, the information, the rules are changing, that could be hard, stressful for a D to not be making a fast pace towards goals and accomplishments. And so while they may be saying, we gotta get stuff done, we gotta get through this, this global pandemic, we gotta do it, the outward appearance that people are seeing may be these on the left here, the restless, critical, being blunt, intrusive, uncooperative, aggressive. So if I'm sitting back and saying, you know what, I'm not really going to make any decisions until the governor says we can go back to movie theaters. And the D is saying, no, we got to do something tomorrow. That may come off very well as aggressive to me. And ultimately, the Ds, when they're in their shadow behavior like this, it can look like they're just dictating to, or to maintain control. They want to have some sort of control, 
And instead of understanding that they can't have all of that control at the moment, today, this week, or next week, um, they may come off as, as these behaviors on the, on the left. Now for the I, you remember the I is about winning over people, winning over hearts and minds. So they got to have some credit. They love that action and interaction. There's uh, got to have a, a quicker pace for stimulation and excitement. Um, there's a degree of prestige saying I'm recognized amongst my peers or I'm recognized amongst the team, which I, like the D's needs aren't necessarily bad until you get into these stress situations where the shadow comes out. And it comes off more as being manipulative, overeager, inconsistent, um, unrealistic, wasteful of time. That was a quick test for you C's. If you're following along, yes, I did skip impulsive. I'm just calling it out to see if you, if you recognize that. Um, so the I can come out as all these things, and especially that wasteful of time, because you remember the I might run in many di different directions. So my office right now is covered up with some different business line ideas. I don't know which one of them are viable, um, but it's, it is getting to the point where it's being wasteful of time and saying, okay, start one instead of just coming up with these ideas. And in their worst, eyes can verbally attack sources of stress. That's really that perceived source of stress. So while I may be worrying about my business uh, during this global pandemic, um, I know more than once I've been pretty short and, and uh, snarky with my eight-year-old about schoolwork. It's the fifth time you've asked me this. Go do this. And in normal circumstances, I can't see myself actually be doing that. It's pretty embarrassing that you, you, know, you just said that to an eight-year-old. He doesn't know. But um, that is a bit of that shadow coming out of attacking what I perceive as him being distressed. He's not stress. It's these other things that are uh, um, that I'm taking it out on. For the S's, remember S's got to know that they're liked amongst the team. They, they rely on personal assurances, a steady pace for comfort and security and relationships. And so when the S's are in a stress situation or, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic, it, um, there's a lot of fast paced information there's a lot of relationships. S's are really good at those knee-to-knee -knee or coffee shop one-on-one -on -one conversations. And if they're not getting those, um, they may appear to be coming off as indecisive, submissive, passive, dependent, hesitant, defensive. They are um, yearning for that steadiness that is very much absent in the world. And so in their shadow, they're not going to probably buck it. You know, when, when Phyllis gets yelled at, in, in the office, you don't see her uh, bucking back very often. So they may be, appear to go along, but the problem is it creates a powder keg. With that going along, building that resentment, and eventually it's gonna, it's gonna blow and it's gonna go somewhere. So this has happened more than once in a quarantine with this guy, me, decides my wife is the source of my stress today and I'm gonna verbally impact. To this lady who's been building that resentment, what do you think happens? It's pretty, pretty ugly. And, uh, and needs to be avoid, avoided. Lastly, the conscientious. Um, remember, they got to know that they're doing the right thing, understanding of principles and details, slow pace for processing information, and they got to make sure they're accurate. So they're the ones that are jumping into the details of um, the, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or making sure that Perhaps if Common Desk reopens, that there's 100% compliance with all the political orders that are out, uh, which is great, except they may appear to be over-relying on, on the data, on documentation, resisting the change, very slow to act, can't meet the deadlines because they're worrying about making sure to get it right. And the last one, unim unimaginative, you know, because they want to comply with all the rules, because they want to get it right, they may not think, be thinking in new and creative ways. All this may ultimately um, amount to withdrawing to avoid that conflict, just literally. Oh, let's see. Okay, so let's take back to this one. Some visuals might help here. Um, so when we're in this crisis, when you're in your stress reaction, this looks like the D's to me, barking out orders, giving direction. The eyes who tend to attack um, are going to be that nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nice, kind wolf. 
until the fangs come out, the steadies. Look at that cat. The cat's listening, it's taking in information, but you know that that's building resentment in that eyes. And the C's may withdraw, just withdraw and shut down. So if you see this behavior, you're not one of them. If you're an S and you see the eye bearing your fangs, now you know what's going on. Now you know they're probably in that stress reaction. And you have a choice to build resentment or say, hey, you know what? My, my tendency is to build resentment. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call it out right now and work through it right now instead of this becoming a problem on and on. And maybe I can help that wolf. Stop, get, stop getting so wound up, realize that their personal prestige is not at risk here, and stop um, bearing their fangs. So I don't know, um, I, I think you, you all should have the ability to unmute yourselves. This is a lot of information. Any questions or comments or concerns before I uh, just, I just have one more little piece about the leadership aspect of this. No questions, but I'm just, me and my husband over here are cracking up and like pointing at each other with, yeah, these, whatever. Yeah, with these things and just how we um, have responded in stress and the way that we communicate. So this is super informative. I'm really enjoying it. it you know, it's in that way that um, when I work with coaching clients, um, I never focus on it because I'm not a marriage therapist, but I consistently get that feedback of, um, I really apply this at home. And if you think about it, that's probably where the biggest spotlight is right now in relationships and this communication. So are, um, are you willing to share your profiles with us, what you think you are? Yeah, um, I resonate pretty strongly just from this brief overview of it of, with the D. And then my husband is um, an S, I think. Yeah. And so in the um, in the in-depth class, um, the four hour version I do, we spend quite a bit of time looking at um, how each profile can adapt to the other. But the biggest thing to remember is that the 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 most the hardest adaptations are when it, are when you're running across the spectrum. So when the D is adapting to the S or the S to the D, that takes the most work, as in the I to the C or the C to the I because you're talking about different pace, priorities, uh, patterns, all those things. Um, and so I, you know, I, I don't mind telling on you just setting this up. I, 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 was, I was hoping you'd say you were a D because I saw that come through in your communication, right? Matt, I need a, a title. Matt, I need a deadline. Not in a rude way, but straight to the point where other patterns would, would communicate a little differently. And when you get really successful, y'all, is when you find that you adapt to people's patterns and then you adjust how you communicate to expedite the communication. So I, I had a, um, um, I still, she's a friend, but she was a client. She was a VP of HR and I was trying to sell her a series of courses and I would send these long elaborate I emails that said all about the details and how everybody would feel doing it and some other people who've done it and she would never respond. And then I realized she's a very high D. High Ds like to make quick, rapid decisions with just limited information. So finally I sent her an email and it said, here's your four options. Option A, the name of the class, the price. And after three months of selling, she replied back, let's go with option C, can you start next week? Because I had to adjust to her D uh, profile. Very cool. A good example. Thank you for sharing that. So this is um, this really connects to leadership for me because um, I, I practice. I try to practice and teach others about servant leadership because I've seen the power of it play out in my life, and I've seen the power of it play out in, in small organizations. Uh, whether you use the word or not, for example, Common Desk, large companies like Southwest Airlines. And one of my favorite Robert Greenleaf quotes, Robert Greenleaf was, uh, he's kind of recognized as the father of servant leadership. He wrote the original essay called The Servant as Leader. And um, he learned a lot about leadership from practicing it. So he worked for AT&T and in the 30s and 40s, he would go out and meet with supervisors in the field all around the country. And he learned that this, the high performing teams all had leaders who really viewed themselves not from a position of power, but as a position of being servants to their team so that their team could succeed. And when they chose to be a servant first, then they became leaders because of the respect that they got 
and the loyalty that they earn. And um, so he's on the left there. On the right is Dr. Anne McGee Cooper, who's, who's now, she passed away in 2016. She's kind of being referred to as the grandmother of servant leadership. She was mentored by Bob Greenleaf, and she was my mentor for about 15 years. And one of the most powerful things that uh, she always conveyed to me from her time with, uh, with Robert Greenleaf was this, this quote here, a true natural servant automatically responds to any problem by listening first. And Greenleaf had another quote. He would say, only speak if you can improve upon the silence. And as, you, as we think about communication, uh, I bet like me, I bet your mindset as we've been going through all these disc profiles is you actually communicating out what your communication patterns are. And that is only a small portion of the equation. Regardless of the, of the profiles, I think the very most important thing you can be doing right now is, uh, is listening. And when a problem comes up, not just um, jumping to conclusions, not just saying, I'm the leader, I can handle this, but listening to others, listening to uh, people who bring you problems, asking questions that solicit that listening um, to, uh, to, to avoid miscommunication. When the, the eye is baring their fangs and barking, asking the question, hey, hey, tell me what's really going on right now or the D is giving direction, asking the question of, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? What would success look like to you? When the S is um, in that, uh, maybe that going along, ask, just pausing a second saying, hey, I'm picking up on something. Maybe something's bothering you more than you're sharing with me. Or when the C is just withdrawing, just saying, hey, what do you think is at risk here? What are you worrying about getting wrong? Maybe we can work through this. And then listening instead of, elevating up and up into your um, making one level of bad communication amped up by another amped up by another asking questions and listening can really bring that down i'm going to skip this next video um, and and just leave you with this quote i came across this quote last year and it's come up as probably a most relevant quote for me during um during this covid era of covid 19 from Pema Chodron, she's a, um, a Buddhist monk, um, an author and mentor and all sorts of things to people. And she said, she wrote, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. And so as as you let that sink in and how to practice compassion in the world that we find ourselves right now, um, your communication, knowing where your shadows are and being vulnerable with them and being willing to share them and talk about them is really how you can show compassion. You see, because if you've got it all figured out, you're the healer, you're the top, you're, you're the, you, you're the boss, you're the, the leader of whatever your work unit, your location, your company, um, it only becomes real to others when we share our own darkness and then we heal together. And how you communicate through that is perhaps one of the most, most um, important things that, um, that I've seen uh, powerful right now from the leaders that I'm talking to, clients that I'm talking to, the stuff that I'm reading. And so I hope that, um, I hope your time was well spent in providing a little bit of foundation of understanding how to do that. There's my, uh, there's my family minus one. We couldn't get the cat in the picture. You see, I'm trying to get the dog in the picture. Uh, but um, if there's uh, anything that I can ever do to help you in your journey of leadership and communication, especially during this crisis time, gosh, I think y'all, I don't know how many other folks join, but y'all should know how to, um, y'all know you can give me a, a call, a, an email, hit me up anytime, and I'll be more than happy to help, uh, especially in these times. Thank you so much, Matt. That was that was awesome. So good. Yeah. I was like, thank you. This was amazing. And I have so many helpful notes that I cannot wait to revisit later. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'll watch this recording a couple times. <laughs> yeah. Very thank cool. you so much also for just um, giving of your time to, <laughs> to us and on such short notice, like you mentioned. And uh, yeah, we're just so grateful for this. I know that I am leaving just with such great notes just like mk said and wanting to apply this to the way that i communicate um, professionally and personally so that's gonna be great
Cool. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. Y'all have a wonderful